Hello everybody, it's Michael Harbridge. Welcome to our live event tonight. We're going to give everybody a few minutes to get into the room and um, I'll go over kind of what we're going to be doing. Um, I'm going to put a link in the comments here for, um, well, that's not working, for where you guys can order things that we're doing. Let me try getting that post in there while we get everybody in. Yeah, Janine, surprised she just walked in. She's like, oh, I'm in a different spot. I moved her closer, so hopefully the sound coming from her will be better. I just put a link in the, the comments there, and we'll post that a few times throughout tonight, um, showing you guys if there's items that you're looking for. We've got everything set up on the website now, and in a couple minutes I'll kind of explain all that. Tonight we're going to be creating... Uh, let me grab this turtle. We're going to be doing these clay turtles. I'm going to show you guys how to construct these, how to do the stamping. We'll talk about doing it on hand-built pieces. We will talk about doing it on pieces that are thrown on a wheel, pieces that are cast with a mold, um, rolling out slabs of clay and different things like that. So um, this is, we're going to be building these tonight and I'll explain about the clay, the firing, the finishes, um, everything that you need to know on that. This video is going to be recorded so it will be available um, later tonight um, on my page and we'll be also be taking these videos and putting them on um, our website. We've just got some editing to do to the video so you'll always be able to refer back to them. I did have somebody ask a couple weeks ago if there could be closed captioning. We had somebody who was deaf who wanted to watch the videos and I found a setting on Facebook here that will allow us to have um, captions and I checked it after last week and it didn't it didn't come up during the live one but when I watched the recording later the captions actually came up and it was pretty accurate I was surprised I thought it might take words and change them into things that, that they weren't supposed to be so um, Lisa sent you a PM about her puzzling phone upgrades that she didn't save in today's slides oh okay I'll check I'll check messages and stuff after we get done with the live tonight so um, we've had a lot of stuff go out and some of your orders have gotten split up. Um, there were a couple things that hadn't come in. The clay cutters, um, they should be in next week. I know a few of you are waiting for those. And we ended up sending a bunch of orders out yesterday or the day before um, that didn't have those. And we'll just send those out when they come in. Extruders came in today. Clay came in today. Um, ribbon dies came in today. Um, colors came in earlier this week I think or last week they came in it's there's a lot of stuff coming in and there's a lot of shipping issues with things um, in different parts of the country and we had somebody passed away from one of the companies that we work with and it's just and then the holidays throw all that in there and COVID it's kind of crazy right now but um, it's all working out and we've got everything set up on the website throughout the the workshop tonight I'm going to um, do some commercial interruptions. But last week, for those of you who were in for the live, um, instead of you guys mentioning what number you want and Janine writing it down and then me messaging you and going through all that, we've actually got the item set up on the website. And what we've changed from last week to make it easier is mm -hmm. I'll show you items tonight. I will have an item number on them from one through nine. And when you go to the link that I've got there on the website, I actually numbered the things one through nine. So it's really easy for you to find. So as we're going through this, if you see something that you like that I show you, just mark down a number. And when you go in there, it's all in numeric order. There's additional items in there as well. But all of the items I'm using tonight are one through um, nine in there. So I'll, I'll talk more about those as we get going. And I do see that people are putting in mm -hmm. that they're interested in the mystery box. If you're new and you're not familiar with the mystery box, the mystery box is a medium flat rate shipping box that we do and it's uh, $35 and $15 for shipping. That box generally has a value of about $100 retail. And um, what we do is if you type in in the comments at any point up to us doing the mystery box that you're interested in the mystery box, Janine will put your name on a slip, we'll put it in a bowl and we'll pull it out and then um, toward the end tonight, we will reveal who gets that mystery box and we'll open that up. And what I can tell you about the mystery box tonight 
and, and I see you guys, I could say it's full of dog poop and you guys have already committed to this. And so I see people doing mystery box, but I wouldn't do that. No, tonight, the mystery box has items related to what we're doing tonight. And it has items related to what we're gonna be doing um, in the next few weeks. We've got some stuff coming up with some painting techniques and some clay techniques and things coming up. So a little bit of what we're doing tonight and a little bit of what's coming up in, in the weeks to come. So um, looks like we got a good group in here. Janine's working on the mystery box things. If you guys have questions as we're going, feel free to type them in. I'll try to, to cover everything tonight and, and get through this. So um, I'm gonna flip the camera down so that you guys can see what we're gonna be doing. So this is because I um, do clay puzzling, as many of you know, um, this is a clay puzzling mold. And so these molds are ceramic bisque. They come with a Velcro strap. And the idea behind these molds was um, to give people who aren't comfortable working, throwing on a wheel, um, a mold to work with that will give them success with creating shapes. Working on a wheel is great, it's fun, but it can be challenging just to get that clay centered for the first time. So with this method, we're gonna be working with moist clay and we're gonna be pressing that inside of the mold. Now you can do the same technique um, with cast pieces, if you've got cast pieces, just take them out of the mold and work with them while they're wet. If you've got pieces that you've hand built or thrown on the wheel, you're gonna work with them while they're wet. Um, with clay puzzling, for those of you not familiar with it, we're taking moist clay, we're flattening it out, and I usually say, try to go about the thickness of a cast piece um, with smaller items. When you get to real big items, you're gonna to wanna to go with um, a little bit thicker clay so that the pieces are more durable. But I'm just breaking off pieces of clay. I'm pressing them, flattening them between my fingers to about the thickness that I want, which is between a quarter to a half an inch. And I'm filling in the inside of each half of these molds. And then we're gonna be putting these together. And if the clay goes above, I just take and tear that off. It doesn't need to go above the edge of the mold um, what we're doing now, <clears throat> it doesn't matter if these pieces are perfectly smooth or they're perfectly even. Um, we're just basically filling in with clay, trying to keep it somewhat uniform in thickness. Um, if you have areas that are super duper thick and areas that are really, really thin on the same piece, what can happen is as they dry, most clay bodies will shrink. And as they shrink, areas that are thicker will dry slower than areas that are thin and those thin areas will shrink and then the other areas won't shrink as quickly and you can get some cracking in the pieces. So you generally want to try to get it somewhat uniform um, thickness throughout. I'm going right up to the edge of the mold. You can see how crude that looks in there. And then I'm going to go through and I'm going to press that clay so that all of those seams where those pieces of clay meet up are eliminated. I don't want to see lines inside there. Now, if you've got long fingernails, um, I recommend using just a washcloth or a piece of fabric or a sponge to press that clay. Um, the, the washcloth will also give you a nice texture. So on the inside of these pieces, you may go back after we get them put together and you may use that towel in there or you may decide to go with a sponge and smooth it out on the inside. But I'm gonna get both of these pressed really well where all that clay meets up. And because we're gonna be covering the surface with um, stamped pieces of clay, like on this turtle here, um, it doesn't matter if the outside is real smooth. So whether you use little pieces of clay or big pieces of clay inside here, it doesn't really matter because most of that is going to be covered up. We just want to make sure when I look at those molds, I don't want to see lines where those pieces of clay meet because that is going to be an area that's going to be weak and want to come apart. Generally with moist clay, you would do what's called scoring where you scratch lines and you would add slip, which is a liquid form of the clay. You would add slip to that um, to put those pieces together. Because we're pressing it against the mold, we don't have to worry about messing around with scoring and slip. Now, before I put this mold together, I wanna remove any of this clay that's over the seam line. So I can take 
a needle tool or a toothpick or a cleaning tool, any type of a tool, and just run it across the edges of that mold to remove any clay that's sticking above. If I don't do that, when I go to put these halves together, that clay is going to get stuck between the two halves and they won't fit together well. So I'm going to remove on this half of the mold as well. And then I'm going to take and I'm going to make a coil of clay because when I put these two halves together, I'm going to reach inside and press that clay together where the two um, halves meet. Because there's a little bit of a gap in there, if I take clay from one side and squish it over, it's going to make it thin in the area where I push the clay away from. So what I'm going to do is just make a coil and it doesn't need to be a real even coil. You can do it with an extruder. You can go on the surface and you can roll your coil so it's perfect, um, but probably between a quarter to a half an inch. And on just one half of this, down inside the mold, I'm going to add that coil. So that coil is not sticking above the, the seam line. It's basically flush with the top of that clay piece. Then when I put these together, um, because this is a smaller mold, I'm not too concerned because I can take and just set this together. But if it was a bigger mold, I would put my hand on the inside to hold that clay, or I would put it on the sides like this. So as I flip it over, that clay doesn't want to flop out. Um, but on this little mold, it's pretty easy just to take my fingers, put this together, set it together, and then take that Velcro strap. And I kind of hold the end of the strap down with this finger as I pull it around and pull that nice and snug and tight and lock that on the other side. So my mold is together, I've got that coil, and then I'm going to reach inside and that coil is on this half of the mold and I'm going to squish that to fill in that gap and attach the two halves together. Now on these molds it's nice because you can get your hands inside and you can see really easily. On some of the molds you don't have that luxury and so We've got a tool that we use. Um, this tool has a foam ball on one end. It has a wood ball on the other end. It's got a little flashlight attached to it. So I can take that on the inside of the molds and do that pressing. On molds with smaller openings, I'll use that wood ball end as smaller than the foam ball end. But on this piece, because I can get my hands inside here, I'm just going to use my thumb to go through and press those coil or that coil of clay to attach the two halves. Now, when I look inside there, notice the line, get this in the camera, right? You can see that line where that clay is on there. I don't want to see that. I want that to be smooth in there so that these pieces are attached really well. I press nice and hard so that that clay fills in that gap. And this is where on the inside, if I wanted to get rid of my fingerprints and anything that's in there, I could take the towel or I could take a sponge and I could go on the inside and I can press this in there to give it this texture. Ooh, I want to know if there's anything in the mystery box that she hasn't already bought. Oh, geez. <laughs> if I could remember what everybody has bought. Uh, <laughs> good question, Luann. Uh, <laughs> she definitely yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to promise that there isn't something in there that you've already bought. I'm trying to to think of what's in there, and I don't honestly remember everything that you've ever purchased. So <laughs> well, There are lots of other people who want it, so if you're not sure, maybe don't, don't try to get it tonight. Okay, yeah, I know. Um, there might be some kangaroos in there, Luann. That's a joke that Luann will understand. Um, so I've got the inside of this pressed, and then I can open up that strap. I'm going to set that Velcro aside, and I can take and just kind of wiggle this mold and pull mm -hmm. off one half. And then with the other half, I just turn this over in my hand and lift off that half of the mold. Now on a small mold like this, it's really easy to take that out right away. It'll stand on its own. Um, there is a little mm -hmm. bit of a seam there where the uh, mold met up. I usually take either a wooden tool or a metal rib and I just kind of go over and scrape that little bit of clay from the seam off. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not worried about the lines on here. So the term clay puzzling came from when you press the pieces of clay in the mold, you get those little lines and it kind of looks like a jigsaw puzzle where the piece is put together. On the inside, that's why I kept saying and stressing, I look in there to make sure that I don't see those lines on the inside. So this piece is attached. I'm not worried that this piece is gonna split where that line is. That line is just where those two pieces of clay met. And by really mashing all that clay together on the inside, I'm not worried about that coming apart at all. And because this is gonna be covered with little clay medallions, um, I'm also not worried about those lines and smoothing them out. If I was doing a piece and I wanted it smooth, I could take that rib and I could go over and I could smooth out any of those lines from the puzzling, but it doesn't matter on this piece because we're actually gonna score this whole surface to add our little medallions of clay on there. So this is your basic shape of the little bowl that we're starting out with to create our turtle. Now the next thing that we're gonna do is create the leg and the neck and the head. And so this is all done. These are hollow tubes of clay. If I was working with a really small little bowl that I could do just like a little pinch pot, I could just roll out solid coils of clay. But because these, these coils are like double the size of my thumb, solid clay like that would take a long time to dry and you would risk that wanting to pop in the kiln. So we're gonna use, and a lot of you in the past weeks have gotten a clay extruder. And some of you got the die attachments that um, make the hollow tubes of clay. So I'm gonna show you how that works. And basically with these extruders, there is a trigger that you squeeze to, to force the clay out and there's a plunger. And so this right here needs to be pulled back because that will allow this plunger on the inside, when I push that trigger in and I pull this, that goes back inside there. And it allows me the space to drop a big coil of clay down inside. All right, so this plunger is pulled all the way back and that brings that all the way to this end. So when I drop clay in here, and I squeeze that trigger, it's gonna force the clay to go in that direction. You don't need to remove this other end when you're doing this. It's just this one end that you remove, this threaded piece, you drop your clay inside, and then you put your attachments on there. Now, with this, these hollow attachments, this part actually goes inside the extruder here. So when you load it with clay, don't load it with clay all the way to the end, load it to about here to leave room for this to drop down inside. Most of the time, you're just using a blank die that goes over the end like this, but with the hollow dies, you need to leave that space in there for the clay. So I've got a, a tube of clay here. So what I do is I kind of lay this on top of the extruder to make sure that I've got about the right amount of space left in there to drop that in. I put that tube of clay inside, I drop this in. Now, each one of the attachments for these dies, and they come with several different types of dies, but they come with two parts. So there's one part that there's a little screw that goes into the middle that holds the little piece in the middle, and you want to have that nice and tight on there. And then there is the second piece that goes on top, or you can drop that into the threaded part, and then that gets screwed on to the end. And now when I squeeze the trigger on the extruder, it'll take a little bit for that clay to start making its way out the end, but you can see that clay coming to the end. And as I squeeze that, I get a nice hollow tube of clay. What kind of clay are you using? I'm, I happen to be working with a stoneware clay because I'm gonna be doing these in some mid-range glazes, um, but you can do this with any clay body. It can be a white, it can be a red, it can be brown, it can be a stoneware clay body, porcelain, um, really any type of, of clay body will work for this. I do like Raku clay bodies and stoneware clay bodies and clay bodies that have sand or grog in them because it um, gives some stability 
to the clay. Now when I get to the end. And what size are the dies? Um, this one is, um, this hollow tube is probably, well, I, I put a tape measure here because I knew somebody would ask for a measurement on something. I'm going to measure the end of this. This one gives us a one inch um, hollow tube. There's one that gives us a larger, about a one and a half inch. I'll show you all the different dies that are in that extruder in just a minute. Once I've got enough of this coil out, I'll take the needle tool or some type of a tool and I'll just cut that off at the end, set my extruder aside. And I do this long tube of clay um, because I'm gonna cut the feet and the head and the neck off of, off of this. So I need to determine based on the size of the little pot that I'm working with for the body, I need to determine how big the feet are. Now, if I want the feet to come out about two inches on the side of here, I'm not gonna cut this to two inches. I'm gonna cut it to probably about three to four inches, and I'll show you in a, in a couple minutes why. So I'm gonna go like this, and I'm gonna cut off a piece. And then to make sure that all the legs are about the same size, I just lay that first piece next to it, and I keep working my way down, cutting off four legs. Set those aside, and then I've got this extra piece, which is more than enough for the neck and the head, but we're going to work, work on the feet first. And so these are hollow, and when I cut them off, they kind of squish down so I can take and uh, make that circular again. But what I want to do is I want to close off the end of that foot. So I'm just going to take and kind of pinch this back and forth and around and close up the end on here, and I usually just use my finger to kind of run over the top of it just to smooth that out. Um, the person actually was meaning the diameter of the ring. She has an, ext she has an extruder. I mean, if it was fit. So the, the, the diameter of this here, you're asking. All right. There's These dies work in the Shimpo. Shimpo is who makes these. Um, they work on the, the Shimpo extruder. They work on the Kemper extruder the Scott Creek ones as well. Um, this is about two and a half, the die is about two and a half inches, or I'm sorry, about two and a quarter inches wide. All right, so I just kind of work the ends of these and I just kind of pinch this in and just smooth out the ends. Now, occasionally, you'll find little air bubbles in here that, that as you squeeze that clay out of the extruder, you might get some little pockets. I just kind of take and squish those down and smooth those out as I smooth that end on each one of these. She has a Kemper, so. Yeah, the Kemper, the gold Kemper, it'll work on there. So just get all four of these legs kind of smoothed out. in any little and sometimes if you get a real big air pocket you can take a little piece of clay and you can kind of squish that in there and smooth that that out sometimes you'll hear kind of a popping sound as you squeeze that extruder and it's just a little bit of air that's trapped in there um, that's those little pockets are kind of popping in there okay so I've got my four legs made now I'm going to take my little pot and I'm going to turn it upside down I had mentioned earlier how normally when you attach pieces of clay, you would score the area and then put slip in there and, and attach those two. Um, whenever you're working with a different type of clay body, for those of you who are casting low fire earthenware pieces, you um, can work with your slip to do this part that you're casting with because it will be compatible with the clay that you've cast the piece with. Um, for the moist clay, if you're doing this with cast pieces, a lot of times what I recommend is um, use the trimmings from your pieces and put those in a plastic bag or a bucket with a little bit of a moisture in there, like a damp towel or a damp paper towel, and work that clay and kind of wedge it, kind of like you're kneading dough, wedge it to get the air pockets out of it and get that moisture evenly worked through the pieces because those trimmings will be the same clay body that you're working with. 
Because I'm working with clay that comes in a block, I don't have to worry about that. But when I want to make slip then with it, what I do is if, if I take a piece of wet clay and I stick it in a bowl of water, it doesn't soften and it doesn't mix. If you've ever tried doing that, you find yourself kind of stirring and squishing that clay trying to make slip. So what I do is I take pieces of that clay, I flatten them out, I let these pieces dry, and then I put a little bit of water in a, in a cup, and I take that clay and I kind of break it up and I drop it in there and it dissolves and turns into a nice slurry consistency. You can always add more water if you need it to be more fluid, but you want the clay that you're using for the slip to be the same as the clay body that you're working with. Because if I use a low fire clay with a mid-range clay body, when it's fired, the slip might shrink more than that clay body, and then your pieces will fall off. So you always want your slip to be compatible with the clay body that you're working with. And so I just flattened out pieces of that same clay, let it dry overnight, and then I bust it up and put it into water. There's a question about which is the better kind of extruder. They're both about the same price, but Kemper holds more clay. Yeah, the main difference between these extruders is their size. I've got the Kemper one here, and, and I sell both of them is the the size of the the barrel on there the kemper one will hold more clay what i like about that one is it holds more clay and when i'm doing projects or workshops i like that one because i don't have to load it as often with clay um, the disadvantage to it is a lot of times if people have a hard time squeezing that trigger it takes more pressure to force that much more clay through the piece so sometimes this can be a little bit harder just because of the amount of clay in the extruder. The other difference is the dies that come with them. They each come with different dies and I'm gonna show you guys in a little bit during a commercial break what comes with each one of these extruders. But I, I like both of them. I can't say that one is necessarily better than the other. Um, they're both really good quality. There are some knockoffs on the market that are, are similar to the Shimpo one. They look very similar, but I've worked with them in studios um, when I go to do workshops and the triggers on them wear out really quickly. I was just at a studio um, a few months ago, the one workshop that I, I did this year, um, and she had some of their, their extruders, and we would squeeze the trigger, and it's like the, it wouldn't even force the clay through. It just, it, it was really cheaply made. So be careful with some of the knockoffs that are out there. The Kemper one is good, and the Shimpo, and Shimpo is now uh, Nidec. It's a uh, it's the same company, same manufacturing. They just um, changed their, their corporate name. All right, so scoring, you can use a needle tool. There are different tools out there, but we're going to scratch lines in the bottom of our piece. And then anywhere that we're going to attach the legs, we're going to, whoops, and I just dropped that one in the slip. I'll just kind of wipe that off. Um, you want to kind of score the area where the leg is going to attach. So I'm just doing, kind of looks like I'm scratching a finger here. Um, I'm just gonna scratch a little over an inch of just that part that's gonna go against the body on there. So I've scored each one of these just in that little area. And these legs are gonna go onto the bottom of the pot. And I'm gonna brush some slip on here first. And then I'm going to take the scored edge, lay that on there, press it down and kind of pull and mash this into the bottom of the body. And I'm gonna do that for all four of the legs. The point of scoring the bottom of this is so that when, these, when this clay gets mashed against there, um, the, the little score marks will kind of lock together. Get that. Now that last leg, I've kind of covered the whole bottom of this. So I'm gonna put a few score marks back in this area, add a little bit of slip there, lay this on here and mash it in. And this mashing in of the legs on here um, really helps to adhere it to the body. And I'll just kind of go and smooth this out a little bit. And 
Now, one thing that some of you are probably like, oh no, you closed up that other end on there and um, there's now no way for gases or air or moisture to get out of the inside of these legs. One of the last things that we're going to do, and I don't, knowing me, I'll probably forget to do this at the end, but once I'm all done with it, I go back on the bottom of these feet and I poke a little hole in it. I'm going to do it now just to show you what I do. I generally do this as the last thing because as we work with these, with this piece, these feet are going to get bent and twisted a little bit and you might end up having to put multiple holes depending on how the wrinkles happen in your feet. And I'm going to show you guys this finished one again. You can see here that this leg has kind of some little wrinkles in it. And if this gets real tight and closes up on there, I'm going to want a vent hole in this area and a vent hole in this area. So it might be putting two or three holes in the bottom of that piece. Um, these legs are going to be kind of floppy at this point. And what I do to get the, the, the turtle to stand up on his own is I put just a cleaning sponge under him to raise him up because I want him to be standing up off of the surface a little bit. And I'm going to move a little board here or a piece of drywall. This is a project board. And then I take and flip him over. If I was doing a bigger turtle and I couldn't handle it as, easy, as easily as this, I would leave that turtle sitting on my surface. I would put the board on top of it and then pick this up and flip it over on the board. And sometimes I would have a second board underneath there so it would make it easier to flip over. But on this little guy, I can easily do this with my hand. Well, now his legs are sticking straight out and he looks pretty silly like that. And this is where now I'm going to take and just kind of gently bend these legs down and I can kind of manipulate them and bend them. And this is where sometimes you'll get some little kinks in those coils that you may end up having to put more uh, holes in there to vent these feet. So I want them to come down and I want them to touch on my surface. And that sponge is under there just to keep him raised up off the surface. If you don't want him standing up off of the surface, you don't need to put the sponge. You can just have his legs kind of going straight out. But I like to have him have a little bit of height here. Then we're gonna go to, I'm just gonna set this aside. We're gonna go to doing the the head and so this is done with a little bit longer coil and you need to determine how long you want his neck and head to be and then add a little bit more because you're going to kind of mash some of this clay into this piece as well so i'm going to cut this off about here again the end of this piece i'm going to do just like i did on the feet and i'm going to pinch the end of this in kind of smooth this out And then I want to create an area for his eyes. So I'm going to take my thumb and my index finger and I'm going to gently pinch on the end of this to make indentations where his eyeballs are going to go. And I'm going to take a couple, um, I'll actually take one piece of clay here and I'll kind of make a little coil. Um, if you're really good at judging and measuring um, the size for the eyes, you can just pinch off a piece of clay, but I tend to find that I end up with um, one eyeball that's bigger than the other. So I, I teach people to do kind of a little coil of clay, cut off the ends so that you've got a coil that, that's pretty uniform in size and, and even on the ends, and then cut that in half. And that way you've got two pieces of clay that should come out to about the same size for the eyeball and then just kind of roll those in your hand so you've got your two eyeballs. Where they're going to attach on here, I'm going to do a little scoring. And on the back side of the eyeball, I'm going to score as well. I'm going to dab a little bit of slip. And then when I put the eyeball in, I'm going to take and I'm going to kind of twist it so that I lock those um, pieces together where I've scored. If I just stick it on there, 
um, it may not really attach well. So I usually kind of go like that and kind of twist it to get that um, pressed in there and, and attached really well. <laughs> Janine's giving me a look at what this, this looks like. Let's get some eyelids on there. Um, so eyelids are just, anal. yeah. <laughs> eyelids are just taking um, little pieces of clay and flattening them out real thin so that they can go over the top <laughs> of that that piece and then we're just going to take and I'm not going to worry about scoring and slipping because I'm going to mash this into this piece and I'm just going to take my finger and squish that down so I've now got an eyelid over that eye and I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. Make it a little bit longer. And I'm just kind of pulling my thumb across and just kind of mashing that clay into the surface. Now, I can also, if I want the snout to be a little bit longer, I can kind of pinch this out a little bit. Um, to do a mouth, I'm just going to take that needle tool and I'm going to lay it right across this and I'm just going to go and cut right into it. You could use a scalpel or a knife as well. And then I'm just going to take and kind of open this up. Um, I want to make sure that the inside of this is, is open. So I'm going to take that needle tool inside because this is what's going to vent his head because we're going to attach that onto the body. We can add some little nostrils on here, just taking and making some little indentations with the needle tool there. Kind of looks creepy like this. And then we're going to go on our turtle and we're going to decide where his head is going to come out and we're going to score the area where we want to attach that, which is like this. And then I'm going to um, score the area where the neck is going to attach. I'm going to add some slip. And then I'm going to attach this and I'm going to kind of pinch this down and drag it into the bottom. Sometimes I'll put the head on um, when I do the feet as well. Um, I just wanted to give you guys a really good visual of the um, how the feet were attached on there. This is really a long <laughs> neck on here, so I'm actually going to take this off. And I'm going to cut about an inch of this off. I'm going to rescore this area. Put a little bit of slip on here. He kind of was looking like ET there for a minute. Again, I kind of wiggle it, kind of mash this in. Now, if the, the head wants to fall forward, I'll take another sponge or two sponges and stack them underneath to give support so that his head doesn't want to flop forward. Or you can take clay, and a lot of times I'll take chunks of clay and I'll just stick those under there because I can get it to the exact height that I want on that piece. So I was asking why you didn't demonstrate the giraffes, and I'm thinking she means the huge ones, but she said the small or medium would be good also. I don't think you've made any other than those big ones, correct? No, we did the small, we did the smaller oh, ones. Hand built. Yeah, we did them with the hollow dies and stuff. Yeah, and that could be a, a live coming up in the future as well. I'm, I can't squeeze too much into a night because some of these lives have gone on for hours and... I, I want to keep them to about an hour. So tonight we're just doing the turtle. All right, so I've got my turtle built. I've got his neck supported. I've got his body supported. And now I want to create my stamped medallions that are going to go on the surface. I'm going to get rid of these plants that are in this guy so it's a little bit easier to show. His poor tail got busted off. He's traveled around the country with me to workshops. But we're going to make all these little medallions that go on top of that surface and that's why we weren't worried about um, if the outside of the turtle was real smooth. So what I do is I roll 
balls of clay and I've got tons of them all around me here where I flattened these out and done the texture before we went live. But last week we showed how to use these stamps doing stamping techniques. And so now this week you can take those same stamps that you've got and thank you everybody who ordered those stamps last week. And you can roll balls of clay and you can press them against the stamp and do different sizes. And when you peel them back, you'll pick up the different textures and go on different areas of the stamp. Don't always go just in the center of the stamp. You can go off to the side and you can get some really interesting textures from these stamps. This one is one of my, my favorites. If you press it in the middle, you get, whoops, you get this kind of funky design on it, but you can also go out on the edges and press it to get really cool designs like that. So make a bunch of medallions using different parts of the stamps, do different sizes. You're gonna want a bunch of real little ones like this that are probably less than an inch um, across. You can also use these little stamps work great because I can just set those down and I can press that clay against there and get some really intricate little designs from those stamps as well. What I And what I generally do is I will take and roll out a whole bunch of balls of clay. I tear a bunch of pieces off. I'll have this whole surface covered with little chunks of clay. Then I sit and I roll all of them and then I go and press them against the stamps. These new little stamps give us some really neat textures as well. Um, I got one big piece of clay left here that I can use on this one. And you want different sizes. You don't want all of these pieces of clay to be the same size. And so I've got lots of them here. I'm going to set my stamps aside. You guys could sit and watch me roll balls of clay and press them into the stamps um, all night long, but I've got a, a ton of them here. So then I'm going to take my turtle and I'm basically going to score the entire shell area on him. And I'm just using the needle tool and scratching lines. When I stamped all of my medallions of clay, instead of having them face up with the, the texture on them, I put them all face down because then I'm gonna go and I'm gonna texture and score the backs of all of them. Are those little stamps in stock? Yep, little stamps are in stock. And surprisingly, and, and I was pleased that we got tons of stamp orders last week, and I think we had every single stamp in stock that everybody ordered. I think all of the stamp orders have now gone out. There were one or two orders, I think, that came in today that will go out tomorrow, but I think all of the the stamps were in stock, and we still, I think we're out of one or two stamps, um, but they're all on the site, and we'll get any of those in that we are out of. On the back of the stamps, I just do, and so I've got all over here. I'm going to just turn the camera back. I've got them all over the place here. And so I'll just go and I'll just kind of real quickly go like this and score the backs of them. You're probably thinking, wow, what a pain to score all that. But it actually goes really fast when you just have them all laying out rather than rolling one ball of clay and then um, pressing it and then turning it over and scoring it. I just do kind of production mode with this. And I always tell people do more than you think you're going to need because you will ultimately probably end up needing more than um, you think you're going to need. If you have some left over, you can always stick them in plastic and use them on another project. So I'm going to score some of these over here. And then I usually start out with some of the bigger ones and I'll do a little section at a time. I'm going to kind of turn him on his, his side here. One of the reasons I use the clay to support his neck is because I knew I'd be turning him up on his side and sponges would probably just fall out of there. So um, I'm going to add slip in an area. I'm going to take those medallions and I'm going to start sticking them on. And then I kind of give them that little twist as I attach those so that they stick well. And I don't worry about covering every single inch of this necessarily. And I'll lift this up after I add a bunch of medallions and kind of show you what I mean by that. I'm gonna 
add some big ones in here. And then once I do some big ones, then I fill in with some of the smaller ones in some of the areas in between. I leave the really small ones for the end. And I'm just going to do a little bit more of an area here and then I'll lift him up and show you what I've done on here. And I go right down to his feet. I'm not overlapping these medallions at this point. I'm just trying to cover the majority of the surface with the medallions. All right, so I'm going to lift this guy up and show you guys or turn him on his side. Okay, so there are little openings here and there that don't have the medallions. Okay, so I'm going to do this over the whole surface. And this too will go pretty quickly when you do a section at a time. And the reason I like to do some of the medallions a little bit bigger is because they fill in the space really quickly, but then I'll mix in a few smaller ones here and there. When I have some that go over the top of that edge, I'll just kind of bend them right around the top. Well, are you going to put a hole in the bottom for drainage if it's used for a planter? Yep, all those holes I kind of showed you guys in the bottom of the feet and I kind of explained at the end I usually go through and add holes because as I'm doing all of this, a lot of times if I put holes in in the beginning, some of those holes will end up getting plugged up as I add parts and pieces here. And I think I made enough medallions to cover about three of these, but I didn't want to spend a lot of time during this live rolling balls of clay and boring you guys. Got a few more on the front here, and then I'll pick him up and show you what I've got. All right. So I've got the majority of his body covered. And now all of those little openings that are in there, that's where I kind of save these real small ones to go and fill in. So I'm going to score the backs of a bunch of these little guys. And then I kind of use those as filler. And I say that those are my second layer. And I'm not doing a full second layer, but I use these little ones to fill in the spaces where the bigger ones meet up and so then I'm just taking one medallion at a time and I'm dabbing a little bit of slip on and I'm finding areas that need to be covered and I'm going to pick him up to show this and I will take and press those and I, I kind of hold on the inside as I press that on the outside so that I get it attached fairly well. There's usually enough texture where it's overlapping the other stamps that I'm not worried about um, twisting it as I, as I add it or about scoring. I can give it a little bit of a twist, but I don't want to lose the texture in the stamps. And so I'm going to do a little area here. And again, as I get to the top, I kind of roll these over the top. Do you worry about air gaps in your small attachments? Um, as far as the medallions, I don't. I've never, knock on wood, had any pop off in firing. But as I press these on there, I press them nice and tight so they're pretty much filling in. And I'm gooping the back of these up pretty good with slip so that if there is a little bit of an opening in there, it will fill that in. A lot of times people think that if there's an air trap, the piece is automatically going to blow up in firing. And that actually isn't the case. Explosions happen in the kiln, their pieces pop apart, 
because there's moisture generally trapped in those areas. So if a piece is thoroughly dry and there is an air trap in there, you generally won't have it pop. It's, it's that moisture gets trapped in there and then when it's fired, that moisture turns to a gas and um, expands in there and causes that piece to pop. All right, I'm gonna pick him up here. Um, you can see I'm just putting little medallions kind of in where those pieces met up and where I had little gaps. And I do that all the way around. And up on the, the top as well, where there's a gap, I will put one in and cover that up. Let me score a few more of these. I just remembered why I made extra medallions because I'm going to show you guys. I'm not actually going to make one, but I'm going to show you how to use just a bisque plate or a bisque bowl to make a piece. Some of the pieces that I showed promoting this were um, there was a, a black and white plate that I had done the medallions all around the edge of the plate, and I'm just going to kind of explain that process to you. So if you don't want to hand build pieces or throw pieces and you just want to work with a slab of clay, there's a really easy way to do that as well. I won't finish doing every single spot on here. I think you guys get the general idea. Let me try picking him up now. You can see as we go around, I still have a few little medallions that I could add here and there to fill that in, but you get uh, the general idea. And I'll just let him sit um, to dry. I don't usually use water at this point and try to do any smoothing. Um, I generally want it to dry before I start adding water because a lot of times people get too much water on their pieces and then their pieces want to collapse. Um, one thing that we want to do is we want to add a little tail. And so a little tail is done just rolling a tapered coil of clay. And you can you can do this and you can, you know, give him a little curly cue to his tail. Um, I'll warn you. If you travel with these, they, they tend to get broken off pretty easily. Um, but I do a tapered coil so it gets skinnier at the end and it's a little thicker at the base because this base is where we're going to add this onto the back end here. And so I'm going to score this. I'm going to score kind of on the underside here a little bit where that tail is going to get added. And I'm going to add some slip. I'm going to stick that tail on. I kind of twist it mash it into the body. Are the small ones laying on the frost ones you put on? I think that may be just auto-corrected. <laughs> Are the small ones laying on the frost one? And um, it might have auto-corrected to something else there. I don't on know. the first ones, yeah. First, oh. yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have, I, a, like, I have a funny story about autocorrect. Some of you probably saw my post. Yeah, so they're just kind of filling in the gaps in between. So they are layered on... <laughs> on top of those, you can see there's a little bit of dimensionality to that, that they do overlap. That first layer, though, none of those overlapped. I did the whole first layer, and then I went back with the little ones and filled in in between. So earlier this week, some of you maybe saw my post about, I had somebody message me asking for a link to my gold tampon brush. And, and I sat there and I kind of laughed and I was like, well, I'm assuming autocorrect for that person. The word Taclon, T-A-K-L-O-N, always gets underlined whenever I use it in Word or any type of a program. It doesn't recognize that as a word, but Taclon is a type of bristle in the brush. So her message came through to me to send her a link to my gold tampon brush. And I had posted that and a lot of people got a good chuckle and a good laugh out of that. All right, so... Carol oh. thinks the tail is too big. The tail's <laughs> too big. Well, this is a pretty whimsical little guy. Um, you don't have to make your tail that big on him. Generally, I do make him smaller, um, but it would just be the length of your coil could be a lot shorter coming off on there. I usually add that as one of the last things because um, 
it tends to get, as I move it around, I tend to knock it off. Now I had mentioned earlier about venting. So now I take a look at his feet and like this one here got pressed down pretty flat on there. So I'm just gonna go with that needle tool and I don't need to necessarily pick him up and flip him over because if I'm working with a bigger one, it's not gonna be that easy to do, but I can just take, do this without blocking the camera, kind of lift his foot up a little bit and just poke a little hole in from the bottom. Because I'm worried that I've closed off this area here um, and I might have a pocket here that won't vent out there, I'll go and poke a little hole in that part of his leg. And so that is kind of the last thing that I do on there is I go through and I poke holes into the feet. This leg here, this one too, really got squished down. So I'm gonna take and I'm gonna add a little hole up in further into that leg as well. His head I'm not too worried about because his mouth we had cut open. And so that is giving ventilation into the, um, the head as well. And I can take and I can turn his head so he's looking up or I can have him down like he's drinking um, or kind of turn to the side a little bit, um, however you want to do it. Now, I don't focus on smoothing this. If I have really big gaps and things, I might take my finger and smooth it. Don't start taking water to this while the clay is wet because you'll just, most people, they, they start smoothing with their finger in water and they're dipping in. And before you know it, the whole piece is sitting in water. I let them dry. Once they're dry, I go and I do all of my smoothing and perfecting on those pieces. I only use my fingers at this point to smooth out anything, any big gashes or gouges and things that, that I see in the piece. And so that is, turn the camera up here. Oops, trying to get the opposite way. You know, and we can make his mouth open even a little bit further if we want. Now his leg, I can see in the camera, this one here, you can see a little bit of a, a gap under there. And so what I will do is I will take and kind of bring his leg up. And what I'm doing is I'm kind of bringing my hand up like this and forcing his leg up against the body and then bringing the tip of his foot down so that it fills in any gap that I might have between the body and that leg. But I still want all four feet touching the ground. Isn't it time for a commercial? I think it is time for a commercial now that we've got him built before I go on and show you guys the, um, the um, plate and how you can do this with a plate. I'm gonna flip that over on there. Um, so the molds that we used, um, I have a variety of molds. And so you'll find on the website, item number three has all these different size bowls. And um, they go from the small bowl, which is four inches by three and a half inches high the medium bowl, which is the one I have in my hand, is <clears throat> five and a half inches wide and three and a half inches high. And then we go to the larger bowl, and that one is six and a half inches wide by four and a half. And then we also have, if you guys want to make, I'm going to flip the camera up here. If you guys want to make. Lisa said in her box today was a real, genuine dried oak leaf from your tree. Oh, how funny. Yeah, some of those boxes were in our garage and it might have gotten some leaves that blew in there. So if you want to make this bigger turtle, this one, um, and I'll show you how to do the head on the bigger ones, because these bigger ones, the um, extruder doesn't make coils that are that big. But this is the big bowl, and so the big bowl is also under number three on there. This one is, um, i got to turn this around, 10 inches wide by four and a half inches high, I used to do that one. And then there is, if you want, a taller bowl. We've got a taller bowl on there. So this one is number five, the tall bowl. And this one is 11 inches high by 12 inches wide. So you can make a really nice deep turtle bowl. So those are all the, the, the bowl 
puzzling molds that are are available. So you'll find those under item number three, and that large bowl is number five. You'll also find there's item number six is a deep smaller bowl, and that one is six inches high by six inches wide. And then there's a jumbo one that seriously would take up my entire work surface here. And I forgot to grab that turtle and bring him in. I'm just going to quick go grab him. He's right outside the door here. When I was making this one, I joked that the small child could ride on this turtle. Okay, you guys want a really big turtle? That's what that biggest bowl is going to give you, this really giant guy. So I'm going to show you guys how the heads are done on these big turtles because the extruder doesn't make coils that are quite that big. And so those are done just taking clay. And you can either do a slab of clay <clears throat> And you can roll it out with a rolling pin. You can do it with a slab roller. Um, and if I did a, a bigger piece of clay, I could wrap it around this way to make a hollow tube, or I can take it this way. And if I was doing a leg, I would probably do this longer, but I just kind of fold that over and kind of mash that clay together. And the reason this works well with the larger turtles is because I can easily get my fingers inside here to work this. And then I can take this end and kind of pinch it in the same as we did with the, um, the smaller turtle. But I've got a finger on the inside there to kind of support that clay. And I can kind of squish that together on the end and basically do the same thing as we did with those extruded coils of clay. Sabrina is wondering if the extruder she ordered comes with the die that's needed or if that's an extra purchase. Um, I'll show the extruders in a minute. I'm trying to remember. I don't think, I think the extruder that you ordered, Sabrina, has the basic dies in it. I can't remember if you ordered the gold one or the silver one, but I'll show those in a minute, what dies come with them. And then the hollow dies are an additional set, and I'll show those in a minute as well. So this is how you'll make you know, bigger tubes for legs or for the head on one of these bigger uh, turtles. All right, so this is kind of uh, probably even bigger than, than this one, but do it proportionate to the size of the bowl that you're working with. And then basically add those on, do your medallions and everything the same way as we did on the small turtle. All right, let me show you guys the extruders. So we've got the the Shimpo, now the Nidic um, logo is, is on those. And these extruders, I showed you the, the difference in length. Um, the other difference is the dies. So with the Shimpo, you get a variety of dies. You get a large ribbon or rectangular shape. You get a square die, you get the spaghetti die. This is the one that we used on the beards, on the gnomes. You get a larger circle, you get a triangle, and then you get a blank die. And this blank die is one that you can drill just with a power drill. You can drill holes in it. I'm just digging through my dies here to find one. Like this one I turned into two larger coils of clay. And all these dies are interchangeable between the, the two extruders, but you can just use a power drill and drill through these with a drill bit that can go through aluminum um, to make your own dies with holes as well. So that's what comes with the shorter, the Shimpo extruder is all of those dies. The Kemper extruder, we just got these back in stock today for those of you who've been waiting for these. They're back in stock and they'll be shipping tomorrow. This one comes with a, a smaller round circle, a little bit bigger round circle, one that's even a little bit bigger, and then a three hole um, die. And this one can be used for beards and for the coil puzzling and stuff that I showed in one of the other um, 
lives that I did. And these different size coils, when you're doing puzzling inside the molds, doing the coil technique, bigger pieces, you're going to want wider coils, smaller pieces, you're going to want smaller coils. This one and the triple one are very close in size, but when I'm doing extruder techniques and I need a lot of clay in a workshop, I use that three one because I get three coils of clay out at a time. So that's what comes with the gold extruder. Now, the hollow dies, that is a separate set, and, and Shimpo Nidic makes those. And let me put these aside and I'll show you what comes in. So with that hollow die set, and this is, oh, this is number nine. The other extruders, the Shimpo extruder is item number four. And anything on my website too, $50 orders and over, get free shipping in the US 48. If it's small enough to fit it in a flat rate shipping box, it's free shipping um, all to all 50 states. Um, the Kemper extruder is number eight. And that one also automatically qualifies for free shipping. The hollow die set comes with your base piece that fits down and drops down into the extruder. Again, that works on pretty much all of the extruders. Um, it comes with that second die that goes with it. So this is a larger tube. This is larger than the tube that we just did on the smaller turtle for that bigger pot that comes in that set. Um, you can do that that larger so that's this one here is the larger then there is a smaller this is the one that we used for our turtle now that gives you a little bit smaller circle there is a triangle an octagon that rectangular shape and then it has the small piece that goes into the middle so you get a hollow rectangular tube you might be talking about this now, but can you get both dies from the gold extruder separate for the gold extruder separate? Um, we, we do sell the three hole die uh, separately. Um, and if you need individual ones of just the, the plain holes, they, they can be ordered separately. Just message me. And there's two smaller or there's a large and a small square shape that comes with the two. There's also an oval shape. And I when I store these, um, to keep these together when I store them, I put a piece of tape on there to tape the parts together so that I don't lose those little pieces. And so that's how I store them when I'm not using them. And so you get that oval shape in there too. And Luann was talking before about the um, giraffes and we use that oval shape on the giraffes. That oval shape also works on the, the feet and things like that on the turtles as well if you don't want perfectly round, you can do them with um, an oval shape. So that die set on the website is number nine. And um, that is um, $36.95. And that can be, be ordered there as well. Um, I also was going to mention with the bowls, there are sets. I'm just looking for my slip here on it. I forgot to mention those when I was showing the holes. So they do come in sets. And so you can get those three small bowls. We've got a special on that for $49.95, all three of those bowls. And you can get the set of four with that larger bowl, and it's $74.95. It's a $30 savings on that, and there's free shipping on that as well. So you'll see when you go on the website, you'll see all of those different options. We photographed everything so that you could see all of those options on the site as well. All right, I wanna to talk to you guys. If you saw that picture that I had of that black and white platter, really easy to do. So I work with bisque shapes and um, you can just do like a slab of clay. You can also do clay puzzling on pieces like this, just pressing the clay and working that onto the surface. Um, I do find that on flat pieces like this or bowls that I can um, just, if you do um, paste in there, I had copied the oh, link and maybe just, like, just, oh, it is right it, there. It, it is, keeps it keeps, okay, so bottom. that, yeah, that is there. So Lewis, yeah, you can just order that right. And I, I thought you guys 
check and see if your wife ordered. I thought she ordered that hollow die set, but I can't remember <laughs> for sure. Um, oh, if we have an order that was waiting on the extruder, can we add these to them without extra shipping if they fit? Yeah, just send me a message. That's a good question. If you can add to an order that's still here waiting to ship um, and not get charged shipping, um, send me a private message and I'll give you a code that will take the shipping off when it tries to add the shipping to your order. So I can do generally a slab of clay. I'll put it over the top of this, cut it, or I'll lay the plate on top, cut it out, and then lay that on top of there. And then I can take all of my medallions once I've scored the back. And on that platter that I showed, I had done the medallions all around the outer edge on there. So I scored the whole outer edge. And then I added all of the medallions on the edge. And I'm just going to kind of lay these on here to give you an idea of what it would kind of look like. So then I just added, oops, medallions all around the edge, did the same thing. I put down one layer and then I went back and I filled in the gaps with the little medallions. And that plate was really easy to finish. It was done with black stroke and coat, a speckled tuxedo on the solid black areas. And on the outer edge, I just did one coat of kind of watered down tuxedo um, that was maybe one part color, one part water, brush that on the outside, and then I sponged it back. I went back with a sponge. So all of the color puddled in all of those textures on there, and it turned out really great. So check that out on some of the promo pieces. I'll, I'll post that picture in here later tonight for those of you that didn't catch that. They want you to show the finished plate again, please. The finished plate. I don't have a finished plate here to oh. show. <laughs> no, you're asking to see. It says, please show plate again. So did you show us one? Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking around here to see if I, um, that plate had gotten sold and I don't have another one here to show. But I will I will post that picture in there, Carol, and, and show that in there. Um, oh, and I think, Kathy, are you the one that got that? I had, I had sold that at one of the lives earlier this year when mm -hmm. I sold a lot of the finished samples. So yeah, I think Kathy did get that. <laughs> um, but it, it's a cool piece. So, you know, you can use products like Stroke and Coat to finish these. The other thing that looks great, and I left this in the specials on the website, is the um, element glazes, because they will kind of puddle in the crevices and they will um, get kind of multi-tone colors to them as well. And I just want to show you guys on the website um, when you go to our, our website now, um, if you haven't gone on to, to order anything from the lives, when you go into the website, there will be a pop-up that will come on. It'll ask if you want to enter your email to get notifications and specials and things. You can do that. I encourage you to do that. We don't sell your names. We don't use them for anything other than periodically we'll send out a promotional email. But if you scroll down on, on there, um, oops, let me go back to, let me go to home here. I've gotten ahead of myself here. All right, so when you go on to our, our website, this is what the home page is going to look like. You can just scroll down, and there's a, a thing that says Live Events. Click on that Live Event, and it will take you right into all of the items that are on special. It's taking a minute here for it to load, and it will show. And so whoever gets the, the, the uh, mystery box tonight, Item number one on the, the website is live event pay by dollar amount. We used to do everything this way that you would put in the dollar amount. If you ever get confused on something, you can use that, um, but you can use that for the, um, the uh, mystery box and just type in the amount. And then it has all the other items. And I'm gonna show you guys these, these sanding sticks here in a minute. Item number two, item number three, this is the bowls and there's more options. If you click on that, it will take you into all of the options you can select. There's a drop down, and so it lists the bowls individually. It lists them as sets, if I can get the light reflection off of here. Um, and so you can select whatever one you want there. Um, you go back. Got a question? Yeah. Can you use a glass slump mold that you use to slump glass? Use it to do a clay form, then use it again for glass? That's a, a great question, Angela. If you can use a glass slump mold that you use for glass, use it for clay, and then use it for glass again, um, you can. You just need to be careful because usually there's a glass separator on those molds, 
And as you press the clay against there, you may end up getting some of that, if any of that glass separator is loose, it might come off and get into your clay, um, which could fire out a little bit different. So make sure that you don't have any loose glass separator on those molds, and then make sure that the mold is cleaned off, that there isn't any clay left on there before you go to do glass again. But yeah, you definitely can use those as forms um, to do clay work on top of like I was showing here. Sometimes people will put even a layer of newspaper over that mold so that you don't have to worry about any of the um, glass separator coming into contact with the clay if you just do a layer of newspaper or even a piece of plastic, a plastic bag or something over it to protect that mold. But you can see all of the items and they're listed by item number, um, the hollow dies, mm -hmm. and then there are other items in there. There's also a free download in there for different clay puzzling techniques. Um, we did the presents already a, a few weeks ago. Um, I'm gonna be doing fish, we're gonna be doing owls next week. Um, there's gonna be some egg techniques coming up that we're gonna be doing. I do have the cones on there yet. For those of you that ordered cones, they we actually got done filling all of the orders today. There's a few orders going out tomorrow. I know one person got theirs and it was broken and we're gonna be shipping a replacement, one of those out. Uh, but we are caught up pretty much on the cones right now. So I did leave those on there because I know some people didn't get on that special earlier. That elements kit is on there. Look at those colors and how they, they react with the textures on those tiles. And those kits are on sale. There's um, foundations. Jungle gems look great on textured pieces like this as well. So take a look. There's lots of different specials and things on the website for you guys to, to take advantage of. All right, we got any other questions? Um, so are the pressed clay discs on this disc bowl to fill the bowl completely and then dry and fire as a fancy bowl? Sorry, I missed it. No, it was oh, doing okay. a slab of clay over the whole thing and then building these medallions around the edge of the plate is what I had done on, on the, the finished piece that I'll, I'll put that picture back up here in this post tonight too to remind you guys of that. But I was just kind of showing on there how to add the medallions around the edge. If I did though, that's a good question, Lisa. If I did a whole plate and I just did these medallions and kind of slipped them together on here and then filled in the gaps like this, it would be a really fragile piece to try and do. By having a slab of clay as your base that you're working on, it's gonna work a lot easier. Also make sure that the clay doesn't go over the edge of the plate. If it goes over the edge and it rounds that edge, when this clay dries, it wants to shrink. And as it shrinks, it's going to want to crack along anything that goes over the edge. Okay, So make sure that nothing goes around that edge that's just on top. Um, but those pieces can sit on there and dry. Those pieces can stay on there and go in the kiln if you don't want to try to lift them away from there. Um, Drying these pieces, that is a really good question that always comes up. People always ask, how long should the pieces dry before I fire them? Um, I generally recommend letting pieces dry for a week. But if you're in a really humid area, here in Wisconsin in the middle of summer in July and August, we can get really humid days. And I can set pieces outside in the sun during the daytime. And then at night, it gets damp and cool again and then that clay absorbs moisture from the dampness in the air. So it might be dry during the daytime, but then if I put it in the kiln and fire it in the morning, there's moisture that's gone back into that piece. So um, you know, keep that in mind if you're doing it in a basement that's real damp. So I let pieces dry for several days. I usually set them on top of the kiln when I've got um, other pieces that are firing inside the kiln so that the pieces heat up and it gets all that moisture out of there. You can also, in a lot of the newer digital kilns, they are set up so that at the beginning of the firing, you've got a, a program in there that will allow you to preheat the pieces. And so you put in a number of hours that you want them to preheat. And so you can do a several hour hold and what the kiln will do is it will heat up to about 180 degrees it'll hold for how many hours you program. So if you've got pieces that you're, you wanna fire and you're like, ah, I'm not sure that these are perfectly dry, um, 
you know, you can do, there's a test where you take and you touch the piece to your face and if it feels cool, there's still dampness in there. Well, I can have that sitting in my basement and it'll feel cool and it may not have dampness in there. So it's a good test um, that a lot of people use, but I like to take that precaution on pretty much all of my clay pieces now. I do a several hour hold at, a, at that 180 degrees in the kiln um, so that the pieces heat up, it gets that moisture out of there and then it goes right into the firing of the pieces. And very, very rarely do I ever have a piece that blows up. Usually it happens when I'm trying to force that I will take that turtle right now. I'll put it in the kiln and I will try to quickly get that fired tonight. So I might do a two hour hold on it that maybe isn't quite long enough and there's moisture in there and that piece wants to pop. So, you know, a three hour hold, if you've got a few pieces in there that are, are a little damp or you think might be damp, if the pieces are wet clay like that, I will do a 12 hour hold. It, it doesn't cost that much to run the kiln at 180 degrees for 12 hours. The kiln back there right now is heating with more tree cones in there that are drying them out. We're, we were getting about a dozen tree cones out a day and they were coming out of the mold. They were going into the kiln at 180 degrees, holding for several hours. We were cleaning them and firing them that same night or that next day. So. Um, just take that precaution to get your pieces dry. Either set them on top of the kiln so that they heat up fully and get completely dry. Um, but be careful too. You don't want to take a wet piece of clay and set it on a kiln that's really hot because then the bottom of that piece is going to dry really quickly. It's going to shrink and the top is going to stay damp. So let it dry for a few days. Once you think it's pretty well dry, then I set it on top of the kiln to um, to warm it and to heat it. Um, I don't set it on there right away when it's when it's really wet. I hope that makes sense. And you dry it until it's ready to fire? Yeah, and, and so in the digital kilns now, you know, you can you can set that program at the beginning. It will, part of the firing cycle is, it'll do a hold at the beginning of the firing. And then it'll go right into the firing. So if I tell it I want a six hour hold, It'll hold at about 180 degrees for six hours, and then it'll go into my 04 greenware firing in the kiln. Um, you can do however many hours of a hold as you want. The longer you do it, the safer you're gonna be. But if you do that hold in there, and you don't have it go right into firing, and then those pieces sit in that kiln and it gets damp, it can, it can take on moisture again. So you wanna try to fire it right away. So if you can program your kiln to do that, the newer kilns all have that in the digital controller, that it will that it will allow you to program that right into the program, and if you can't, you can use the ramp hold feature on there, and basically do the same thing. And if you have questions about that on your kiln, just give me a holler, and I can kind of walk you through that. If you have a manual kiln, um, you know you can turn like one switch on the kiln. If you've got a kiln that has two or three switches, you can put a switch on low, just one switch. That'll turn a few of the elements mm -hmm. on in the kiln. Um, but keep an eye on it. If you have a digital pyrometer that you can put in there to monitor the temperature, that's going to be ideal. You don't want it to get too hot. Sometimes on a manual kiln, it's going to be a matter of turning a switch on low, letting it get warm in there and turn that switch off because it, if that element keeps heating up, it, it might get up to 500 degrees in there and then your pieces will start popping. So you don't want to go over like about 200 degrees is usually pretty safe. Anything under 200 will help you dry it. If you let it dry naturally, should you wrap it with plastic? That, that's a good question. If you should wrap the pieces with plastic if you're letting them dry naturally. Um, the only time that I wrap pieces with plastic is if I've got something that's sticking out on the piece that's really thin and, and fragile, and I'm worried that that piece is gonna dry quicker than the rest of the piece, you can get some pieces that are splitting. And so a lot of times people will wrap plastic on areas that, that look like they're gonna dry faster than the rest of the piece. Um, generally, I don't need to do that. She means the turtle. So the turtle, no. I would just, I would let him sit out and dry. Be careful that you don't have air vents and things blowing down, though, because if there's air blowing or a fan blowing on it, sometimes people try to dry pieces by putting a fan on them. Well, if the fan hits one side and it's not hitting the other side, the one side is drying faster than the other side and you can get some problems with, with cracking. So try to just set it somewhere. There can be circulation in the room, but don't have something blowing right on it because then you, you will run into some cracking. 
Digital Pyrometer, best place to get it. You've got an old manual Duncan kiln. Um, we're actually, um, we've got pyrometers. We were, we sold pyrometers for many years and then our supplier didn't have them available anymore. And we found another supplier for digital pyrometers. And I wanna say they're gonna be under $80 and they haven't come in yet. There's lots of issues with shipping right now and freight lines and the holidays and COVID and stuff. And so as soon as those come in, we'll be putting those up on our website and have those available as well. Um, okay, could it, Sabrina's asking about drying pieces in the oven. Um, you can, um, I, I really don't, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Don't preheat the oven and put the pieces in, put the pieces in there and then heat the oven up, but don't go over 200 degrees in there. Can the oven be set to be, it can be that set. Yeah. Okay, so 200 is, is probably something that can be, can be set on there, yeah. All right, I'm just gonna look at my list over here to see. We've got the mystery box um, yet I've got on there and yeah that's uh, so if anybody has questions um we're gonna draw a name out here for the mystery box mixing them up here i think i gotta get a bigger bowl for this mm -hmm. uh what is the last name on that it's Marjorie Bordner. Okay. I remember seeing her name before. So Marjorie Bordner. You get the mystery box. And if I open this mystery box and Marjorie says, oh, that's not really something that I can use. I don't want to stick anybody with anything that they can't use. We'll draw another name out of there. So let me grab okay, one. Angela got her mystery box today on her birthday. Oh, wow. Yay. That's cool. <laughs> All right. I'm going to flip this down so you guys can see. What's in the mystery box? Is is Marjorie still in here? Let us know if you're you're in here, Marjorie, and if you like what you find in the box. Uh, Brenda was asking if you have any tips to dry molds because you mentioned you did several clones in a day. How do you keep the molds to keep them? <laughs> That's a good question, <laughs> Brenda. The um the cone molds we we made ourselves. They're a custom mold, and we made those molds. They weigh like even that small seven inch cone. That mold is is bigger than this box and of course taller than this box we make them with a ton of plaster so that they can absorb a lot of moisture and we can pour them over and over um, as far as drying molds out though just a fan um, a lot of times i'll put them in the kiln room and i'll have a fan blowing in that room don't get them too close to heat molds can crack plaster molds can crack really easily if you try to dry them too quickly i had one time i got a mold that I kind of slid under the kiln a little bit and it got a little too hot under there and the mold like cracked and just almost disintegrated. It was just like powder. So in this box, there oh, are Marjorie, some- Margie oh, is, Margie is. Okay, is here, okay. So in this box, there are some issues of, of fire arts and crafts. We've still got some of these left. Some of you order color kits, got some of these. Um, these this happens to be a birdhouse um, condo that I did that was on the cover. These were some tree techniques that I haven't covered yet. Um, and there's another issue there that has some glass and some other techniques in it. So that's one, one of the things you get in there. You also got in the box tonight, you got one of the molds for the, the clay puzzling. You got an egg mold. So coming up in a few weeks, we're gonna be doing some really cool stuff with eggs. I'm gonna be doing some stuff with clay. We're gonna be doing some really cool stuff with color. So you got one of these egg molds in the box as well. You also got um, some bisque eggs. We're gonna be doing some stuff with the Azura markers on eggs. We're gonna be doing some stuff with, you got a whole assortment of different underglazes. These are all clay-based colors from Mako in this box. Um, you got wax resist. Some of you saw that blue tree that I did in one of the first lives. Um, we're gonna be doing some really cool stuff with marbleizing using the wax resist and glazes and the Spectaclear on eggs and baskets and different things. Um, you also got a bottle of silkscreen medium. Um, this is for thickening glazes. We're gonna be using this on some upcoming webinars where we're gonna be using um, stencils. And I'm gonna show you guys how to thicken the glaze and to have really good success using stencils. You also got a whole assortment of the Azure markers in here. You got the Aquaflow brushes for the alcohol with those. 
and you got a bottle of sealer to go with those and you also got a bunch of brushes in here too so if if this isn't something that you want mergy um, let us know or if you're thrilled with it let us know if you're not if you don't want it we'll we'll draw another name out of the box but that's what all comes in there and so what margie will do or whoever gets this box is when they go into the link that we gave on the website um, you can um, just go in and use the the number one which is you just put in the dollar amount and you can just put in fifty dollars and that includes the shipping it's 35 for the box and 15 for for shipping on this kathy is asking who got the box it's actually margie right now that that got it um yeah and i see angela just replied to her so margie just let us know if you're good with this if you're not we're going to draw somebody else's name out for that while we wait for her to, to respond um, i want to remind you guys next week we're going to be doing some clay owls and i actually busted this piece today as i was setting up so this poor guy has a band-aid on i glued his eye on i think i can take this tape off now um, but we're going to be doing clay owls next week and and if i'll post some pictures in here and you'll see um the pictures that i post this week um these are done this one is done with a, a vase doing the clay puzzling with a vase and then we turn it into an owl i see margie okay yeah. you like it that's good um we use the leaves that we used for the trees sometimes i do the feathers with leaves um, there's lots of different cool stuff that we can do with these and, and if you're not into owls the same thing you can do fish you can do other critters as well but this is what we're going to be doing next week is building pieces with clay oh and i forgot his little frou-frou got busted off there too so um that is is what we're going to be doing next week and then the weeks following that we're going to be doing some clay projects with eggs we're going to be doing um, some painting techniques with eggs and baskets and things as well so um, i hope you guys look forward to that i appreciate you joining us tonight make sure you go in um, you know i'll continue to do these lives for free as long as um, people continue to order stuff and um, we'll keep coming up with new stuff to show oh i did forget to, to show one last thing i saw this when i was going through these sanding sticks a lot of you have actually already ordered these these are are the number two special and these they come two to a pack and they are good quality they're not some cheap um sanding sticks and they're really inexpensive they're seven dollars for the set of, of six of these so a little over a dollar a piece but there's different grits and there's three different there's a, a coarse a fine and a medium and these are really nice if you've got bisque that needs to be sanded it can be used on greenware we're going to be using these on one of the upcoming webinars for some sanding techniques with underglazes and things as well so check those out um, we've got those in stock and those are, are ready to ship and we'll be using those on some some projects coming up as well all right someone's wondering about valentine's items coming up <clears throat> Valentine's items. Um, yeah, actually, I, I, the other day I was thinking about doing a gnome holding a big heart. Um, I'm working on a leprechaun gnome. Um, we'll see. I, I haven't I haven't got a whole lot planned for Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day kind of always sneaks up on us with you get through, you know, Christmas and New Year's and then it's like, oh my gosh, Valentine's Day is here and you don't have a lot of time to, to get things done for that. But um, I'll see what I can come up with for Valentine's Day. and. Um, maybe next week I'll I'll have an idea of something that we can do. So, all right. Thanks for joining us tonight, you guys. And I look forward to seeing everybody next week. Um, send me questions and things that you have. Um, be happy to help you out. Take care. <laughs>